coming, and Happy New Year to everybody. Right. Uh, Happy New Year. I certainly hope and pray that 2014 is a better year than 2013, and a better year than 2012 uh, for all of us. Um, we uh, we are actually having this meeting at the request of John uh, Boudreaux, and uh, from the crowd I can tell that there's obviously been uh, a gap, and probably not in that communication uh, from us to the community. And so, uh, depending on you know the, the consensus or whatever I sense from you all tonight, if we need to get these regularly scheduled, then we'll certainly do that. But uh, you know, we have to factor in the, the holidays occurred, and we really didn't have anything major taking place in the community, and that's why we shifted these meetings over to this trailer and away from the, the bigger building in uh, Collinsville, was so we could talk directly to folks about things that are going on right in the community. There have been some big developments lately. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard the, the South Berm uh, got to a point where we considered it to be at risk or in jeopardy. Uh, so we have begun the process of installing what we call a new South Berm. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. And uh, I'm also going to talk to you about a, a series of new wells that will be installed. Uh, some of them will be ORW wells, consistent with these that were just put in uh, down here. And, Sportsman Landing and on the west side of the bayou, and then we're going to install uh, or complete rather five uh, what we call passive bed wells, which are very shallow 20 to 30, maybe 20 to 40 feet, and they're intended to capture the gas that's contained in the, the very shallow and what we think are confined sand lenses in the aquitard above the aquifer. And the basis for going after these uh, lenses is information that we gathered from from prior well bores, either CPTs, MIHPTs, or even the dual phase vapor extraction well uh, that was started right over here uh, just to the, uh, to the east of us. So we have solid information uh, to conclude that there, there are little lenses, small pockets of gas, and that's what we're targeting with these passive vent wells. The most recent experience that we had with the passive vent well was right over here uh, to the northwest. I think, is it on this? Yeah. Right up in this area here, Will? Yeah. Uh, adjacent to what we call Bubble Site 56, and that was where we came in with respec and we installed a well at about 30 feet. About 30 and feet. it belched for a good 24 hours. Uh, the adjacent bubble site became inactive. Uh, we shut the well in, and the pressure remains relatively <laughs> low. So it's given us some encouragement that maybe these lenses are confined. Maybe they're not getting any recharge, and that maybe uh, we can attack them and, and cause the bubbling to go away, specific bubble sites. So that's giving us some encouragement, and that's why we're moving forward with that, with that plan. Um, I you know, put together two or three pages of notes here. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot more to, uh, to provide. I can give you more details. Uh, if you'll bear with me, I'll kind of read through this, and then if we have any questions after, uh, myself and, and our team of consultants will be available for hour long things to get you guys satisfied. But before I start, let me just ask: Do we do we need to uh, begin a or schedule a series of, of these community meetings here, or should we go back over to the Holy Bill and have a bigger one? I, I don't really we need know. more room. Okay. That's, that's pretty obvious. Personally, I like the meetings here better. Up, up there is a greater sense yeah. of family, I yeah. think, among mm -hmm. the people by having a meeting here. I know this is the probably the most crowded <coughs> we've had since we started here in the trailer. I think some of that is probably because we haven't had a meeting in a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And curiosity is up. And I think also because of the fact that we've moved on this new South Berm, and that's generated a lot of interest. <laughs> Um, but in any event, uh, it sounds like maybe we can continue here. And what we should do is maybe set up a schedule of, of having a, a public meeting at least every month until it just gets to the point where we don't have a whole lot more to talk about. That's what we're saying. Um, okay, to start with, the passive vent wells. Uh, let me refer to this drawing here to give you an idea of where they're located. We've got two that are already existing, what we call the dual phase vapor extraction 37 and the dual phase vapor extraction 22. If you recall, there was a period where we were considering dual phase vapor extraction before we realized 
the impact of massive volumes of water production and risk of subsidence. Well, that project had already left the station. We had these wells installed. They're sitting idle now, so we're going to use those because we know we have some shallow gas in those two areas. And then we'll be installing three new wells at these locations here. And they'll be done with the, uh, the same rig, same size rig that was used for the MIHPT uh, boring. So it'll be a very small, non-intrusive. Our expectation is that we'll get down to about 20 or 30 feet and encounter some gas that we can relieve to atmosphere. It'll be at low pressure. It should, it should contain little or no water, but it may have some water. If it does uh, produce water, we'll be prepared, uh, prepared to capture it and, and haul it back into the central consistent with our DEQ permits. Okay? Now what we intend to do, because it's low volume, low pressure, and we think short-lived, <coughs> is we're going to man the wells. Uh, we'll, put a, we'll put a body out there, put a person on the location to monitor the venting and make sure that things go safely. If, if it takes more than you know, 24 hours, 36 hours, then we'll, we'll look into uh, the possibility of installing the flare. But venting will take place through riser pipes at least 8 feet above ground. We can go higher if, if we think we need to. Uh, we don't expect that there will be any uh, uh, hazards or risks. As you all know, natural gas is lighter than atmosphere, so it should go straight on up. And like I said, if there's any water produced, we'll have a tote and we'll be prepared to capture it. It's pretty much instant dissipation. <coughs> Oh yeah, the, the gas. The gas. Yeah, the gas, the density, the lighter gas yeah. goes up instantly. The water, different story, but uh, we'll be prepared for that if we, if we produce it. So that's uh, that pretty much sums up uh, where we are on that. Um, and, and really, this was the basis for having the community meeting. We knew that, that you know, moving back in and construction, we wanted you folks to know that we were coming. Uh, we don't have anything planned in this area, except of course. Uh, 22, the recompletion of 22. Uh, we still have ORW 38 uh, light dewatering that's uh, in plant in progress. Our expectation after we get some surveying done is that we'll move on that well uh, probably within the next two to three weeks. And our plan there is to take small volumes of water from that well, maybe one to two gallons a minute, and see if we can induce gas flow. And then we'll use that to go to a select group of other ORW wells that have been non-performers, basically, uh, marginal performers. Uh, Tetra Tech went through a process of, of categorizing uh, all of the ORW wells and look for those that, that have some potential for producing gas. And what we'll do is if we succeed with 38, we'll move to 21. With both of those completed and performing well, we'll come back over here and we'll start to take small volumes of water one to two gallons a minute out of that list of, of wells that Tetra Tech identified as candidates. Okay? So that's what we're, we're referring to as our, as our light rewatering gas production plan. Now, before you move on, well, 37, okay, y'all going to start producing water here? Well, and sending it through the system? We, we don't know. Uh, it, it's possible. If, Okay, because if it performs like the, the one up at uh, bubble site 56, then it could produce about 1,000 gallons, and then it stops. Or if it produces more than that, then we'll have to reassess and, and see what we need to do. Where is that located? Because, you know, if it starts producing a lot of water, I'm going to want, well, y'all will take some kind of elevations there just to make sure that we don't have a subsidence problem. Right. Or if we do have a problem, we'll know about it. Right, right. We don't want to produce a lot of water. And, right. And, and if it looks like the thing wants to do that, we don't expect it, but if it looks like it wants to do that, then we'll shut it in and, and reassess. And we'll put plates down if it, if it looks like we're going to need to produce, you know, for some sustained period of time. But, but everything we're doing, we're basing it on our experience with the passive vent well that went in up at 56, up at bubble site 56. And by our estimates, maybe a thousand gallons total. Yeah, I don't even know if it'll be that much. I mean, we don't want any water. Yeah, we I mean, don't. We're trying to tap into the gas. So. Yeah. yeah we're, our uh, objective is to. That's the well right out here. Up here? Yeah. Right the highway. Yeah. <coughs> so, the Gulfway Factory System, did y'all uh, do a survey or a study on the subsidence? Yes. And what was the result of that? For the uh, testing. Uh, that was done over on the, the North Berm. We, we, we ran, uh, Charlie, do you have the details on the subsidence reporting from that? 
I know it was it was negligible. It was very negligible. I can't remember a third of an inch. I mean, it was uh, third of an inch to three inches, maybe. I can't remember. Yeah. Well, I mean, we to, uh, we ran large volumes, but that was large they, volumes of water. We remain we remain the opinion that dual phase vapor extraction is not an option right now. So appreciate your question, but I'd rather not even go into it if we're not. Well, but what. It's it's not in use. use. I'm going to move it, on. It, isn't that what you said you were doing right over here, those two? Uh, let me talk next about the uh, the berm. Uh, the, uh, the berm, the south berm, experienced about a two to three foot rate of subsidence for a fairly rapid period of time. Uh, it seemed to be consistent with enough heat, enough take for the micro seismicity, micro seismic activity. Uh, it put us on alert. Concerned that, that the tank could sink below the water level and we have a, a connection between the sinkhole waters and the waters outside. Uh, through some uh, careful analysis and a lot of subsidence monitoring, we concluded that, that it, was, uh, it was an intermittent uh, subsidence event, uh, which does seem to be correlated to the micro seismicity. Basically, what we think is happening is when the cavern consumes a little bit more material, it causes a shift. Surface sands move in toward the sinkhole, and we'll get a, an acute event. When I say acute, it may take a week or two, but it, at one point it was subsiding about a foot per week, which was an alarming rate. But fortunately, it stopped, and we've had now you know, we're kind of in the beginning of, of maybe our second period, sustained period, where we, we don't see any seismicity or relative seismicity, and we don't see any major subsidence. Nonetheless, we're checking it weekly, and we're looking for any size that it will pick back up. Now, um, in the interim, before we can get the new south berm completed, at least to the extent that we get the sand road in and we have initial containment, um, we went in and we plan to continue to go in and replace sand and raise that elevation by about 12 inches. So right now we've got at least a foot of, of uh, barrier between the sand hole and the outside. Um, construction I think before it's absolutely complete, what do we estimate, Charlie? Uh, t t it looks like about 24 days for sand and then uh, probably 15 days for clay. A uh, few things here and there, pushing into March, okay. March and April. Okay. So the final design with the okay. DCL and the, the you know turbidity curtains and things like that. So, right. but, but at, the, at the least, the very initial um, separation and containment will be by the end of this. Maybe two and a half, three weeks away. Is that the route? <coughs> yeah, I wanted to show you this is the route. The darker blue line uh, provides you the, uh, the route. And we have begun off the well 10 pad. Uh, are we down to the point yet, Charlie, where we're bending back? I haven't been down there. Well, we're, we're, we're actually right here. As of today, uh, we were waiting to make the part of gas across the right away right here. Sure, so we got that this afternoon. So we're having one of their takes out tomorrow, so we'll be able to push through that for tomorrow. So, so we're so already ahead of schedule. Ahead of schedule, probably you know, at least a third, maybe 35, 40 percent. So we're making good progress there. So what's the what's the estimated distance between Bayou Corn and the New South Burn? Yeah, but what depending what, on depending on where you where you stand, it could be we're, we're probably within. 50 feet at this point, uh, maybe 100 here and a couple of hundred down here. If the growth continues as the subsidence on the South Farm Road suggests, it, it, could, it could go down somewhere about like this and, and extend. We think it's wrapping around the edge of the salt dome, so we think if it, if it does continue, it will come progress in this direction. What, what do you do if uh, the subsidence area? Goes outside of the new South Burn. What's what's? Well, we've we've got some instruments we're putting in new inclinometers that will give us alerts, give us warning, if you will, that that's taking place. And our response will be very similar to what we've done right here, except we'll start looking at, at rerouting. But okay. if if that were the case, uh, have you contacted Corps of Engineers? Because those things, I, as I understand, take 
quite a bit of time. It does take time, but we, we've done our conceptual design, we've looked at options. Uh, Tetratech uh, has prepared a preliminary set of, of uh, reports that would be required. They've done the initial investigation for all of those things that would be required, and we think we're in good standing with the Corps. Uh, we've had excellent progress working with the Corps and getting our emergency use authorizations for these bar, uh, projects. So we're confident that if it comes to that, we don't expect that, if it comes to that, we'll be prepared. Good. But y'all have some benchmarks along the way. If this happens, you'll do this. If this happens, before it even gets to that point. Right. Certainly having the Lakeland on there. Eric, can you show us where they're located? Yes. These guys just put in from North Dakota, so they're kind of scruffy. So, so, uh, it's only 20 below. Oh, that's that's all right. Right. Come down tonight for them. They crawl out of a cave. I love these sacks. So we got two of the numbers raised. Uh, we're going to put in here, um, just right off the old South Berm, and then another 300 feet south down here. Um, so these will be north. Of the new south berm, right between the old berm and the new one, and this one's going to be to about 140 feet, about to the Diablo for Sands, and the one in the south will be somewhere between 70 and 90 feet. And what are you calling them? Inclinometers. And what will they tell you? They tell ground movement. So this whole thing around here is subsiding. Um, you know that. As it subsides, it tends to tilt towards the sinkhole a little bit. And so this will be a string of instruments that will detect that tilt. And as it tilts, we're streaming in real-time data to see how much it's going to tilt if it does tilt. You're basically a, a vertical array that can detect some, some movement off of vertical. Yes. And local issues. The reading local for the issues, yeah. Oh. Well, no, they, they send out the data to the internet and we can pick it up uh, through our server. And, and this, is a, this is an addition to an existing network that's been in place for... Uh, since, since August, since I think, August. 2012. Yeah. You want to show? <laughs> we had instruments right after the sinkhole occurred. We were called and I came down, my name is Eric Krantz. I came down and put in five, five inclinometers right at the surface around the sinkhole. This was back when it was just maybe the size of a quarter on this map. We put in five around here, one on each of the brine tanks, one on the shop, and one on pad three, right above the oxygeyser by three well. And as the sinkhole expanded, we've had to move some of them outward. We lost two during a quick uh, subsidence event. We've been there several feet underwater now. Mark won't let me get scuba gear to die. <coughs> Through, 
that material, they can calculate how far off. And then they also have a process of dropping a sinker bar for validating their findings. I don't think they do uh, the validation uh, very often or very much, but the actual soundings probably collect some 10,000 data points for every profile that they do. How does that, how does that job do with what uh, John Google came up with when he was doing the soundings? It, it doesn't. But I mean, what, what do, you, do you think John's just went down and just kind of curled the wire down? And, or he actually did not? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, I, it's possible that John was out there at <coughs> just the perfect moment where some of this consumption took place and he was able to get that thing down. Who's John? Just well, now, Mark, I think I that our December's matched up pretty good. Up on just the December survey, they, uh, it is a survey crew with a single bar hit 261, and I hit 252. So, uh, so you yeah. thought you hit 750 a while back? I did. And same, you, you, you same spot you, you hit? Yes. You got In general, well, I understand that I'm not using GPS. I'm just visually lining myself up. Uh, but yes. And the same uh, general location. And I did do it this pad uh, uh, two weeks ago, and it was 208. That was after the slough pins on the west. Um, type, what we call type C wells. And uh, Gary Hill will be managing the, the installation. They'll be very consistent with those that we just put in on Sportsman's Land. Uh, they're indicated on this drawing by these orange dots. These two, and actually this one over here, were all chosen by uh, CPT, uh, positive traces of gas uh, by CPT testing. And so we think these are going to be good locations. Yeah, we'll have roads going through here more? Yes, sir. We did have to extend the road from uh, along the bottom, yeah. from 53 down to here. And then we've also got an extension that, that runs on our property across over here. Have public turning schools? Um, yes. Which schools? <laughs> I thought about you the other day when I saw what they were doing. <laughs> so I'm probably, we, did we, did we miss a culvert? I don't know. I'm just wondering. Okay. It'll be I don't think you'll build it yet. It'll be obvious. Oh, so they, the they got to it today. Yeah, we're, we're yeah. putting culverts in there. Yeah. I was wondering for drainage purposes, but other reasons also. Yeah. yeah. It's good for the water. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, 2.4 inch, maybe. Okay, so that'll that'll uh, complete the construction portion. And then, as I mentioned earlier, about uh, when I was talking about uh, RW38 and the dewatering plan, the uh, pilot project that we're going to run on that, um, if that succeeds, and if we find that we can, by taking small volumes of water out, we can get an uptick in gas, or maybe gas you know, <coughs> at all. And certainly, we want to do that. And uh, Tetra Tech, like I said, went through a pretty detailed process of identifying, I think, some 12, I'm not sure the exact number, but there's at least a dozen wells that are good candidate wells. And then we'll start moving over to begin that process. Again, with the objective of maximizing the volume of gas that we're pulling out of the ground. Um, the wells so far that we installed in enforcement have been performing well, with the exception of one. Uh, we're making, I think, I don't know the actual daily, but I know we've made almost 800,000 cubic feet of gas. So, is that right? And our total volume to date is up over 25 million. <coughs> so, all in all, I think we're making progress. I know it's been slow and difficult, but uh, we're creeping up on it. And uh, safety uh, is obviously our, our primary concern. We appreciate you guys being patient with us. And, Open it up to whatever questions you have. Yeah, no questions. The ones on sportsmen and anywhere else, probably. The game that you're taking out, is there any way of knowing if some more is replacing it? Uh, what, we, what we're seeing so far, we put out what's called a, um, it's, it's a daily summary of, of the production. It has cumulative and uh, by well, or cumulative, and then by well production and cumulative. And then we very recently started a new graph that shows the number of producing wells. And if you look at those three drawings, those three graphs, there is a downward trend. Now there are, little, there are periods where the, the production the production will jump up as, as a result of adding new ORWs. But in the, in the long run, if you look at the data, it is trending downward. So we believe that to indicate that there's not 
a massive amount of recharge taking place. We can't we can't say that there's not any recharge, yeah, no. but there doesn't appear to be a massive recharge taking place. So our expectations have, have been fulfilled. You know, we we knew initially in the very beginning when we when we had the incident, we had the event, we, we went out and did everything we could to characterize the oil and gas deposits on the western side of the dome because we knew we had a gas problem. And we, we obviously we had oil on, on the surface of the sinkhole. So our immediate concern was how much is down there, how bad did this thing get, and what we realized that most of it had been depleted, most of it had been produced. So we kind of settled on a volume of about 45 million cubic feet. Now that's plus or minus, and there are some that would say that's not enough, and some that would say that maybe that's too much. But in any event, if you assume that 45 million is a fairly accurate number, and we produce some 25 million, and you assume that at least a third of what was released will ultimately be dissolved in the water and carried away. And I think we're somewhere in the neighborhood of less than 10 million cubic feet remain. I'm sorry, how many are you hearing? 10 million cubic feet? Just an uh, <coughs> approximate, approximate number. The, the well oh. in this, in the subdivision, they were producing pressure water. Uh, you mean, have, has there been a great drop or some drop through the town they were put online? or? Holding about the same pressure? Holding about the same. I don't know that we've, we've detected uh, a drop in the pressure monitor well yet. Was it 16 that went in with the ORWs? Yeah, but I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. So I know it's my understanding. Well, 36 right here in the Boulevard parking lot. I mean, it's been producing for what, six, seven months now. And I think the well head pressure is about the same, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. what I've been 46. Yeah, 46 or 47. Yeah. So one down there. Mm -hmm. We're going to be going down and calling. My claim about recharge is based on the declining production. If it's being recharged, it's doing so at a rate less than, than what we're actually producing. That's how the rates go. The cumulative totals are going up. Couldn't, couldn't those rates be affected by, by the water? Well, we have a rewatering or dewatering process where we're not allowing the wells to water up. So that's, that's a short term. In other words, if the well starts to taper off dramatically, we'll come in and pump water out of it and restore the production. And it, that pretty much confirms that it's not it's water on the same what, what do you do with that water that you take out? It goes back over into the sink. You truck it you didn't you know, run a pipe and all that truck. We had pipe, we had pipe available, and that was what we were thinking about dual phase of extraction. But we just we decided that was too risky. Okay. Any other questions? Well, that pretty much completes everything I, I had. Um, sure, open to any questions uh, or comments. Um, I, I want to go back to dual phase vacuum system. Uh, <clears throat> my question, I guess, is, is that uh, as uh, as the Office of Conservation agreed to the plan that, that you, you presented in? Yes. Yeah. We don't do anything out here without uh, Office of Conservation approval. Okay. Um, can, can you provide us with the results of your subsidence study? Everything that's uh, been done has been submitted to DNR is publicly available. Can the DNR to submit that to us? They are. They are. Hard to uh, get a question. So, Nick, the question about the site. Yes. What, what, uh, <coughs> what's the way the data is for the subsidence? Okay. Well, the DP is different. Subsidence. Well, he's talking about, John, he's talking about the DPVE subsidence. We're talking about dual phase vaccine. So, the DPVE Well, the, the test that we ran on the north side of the sinkhole on the berm, and we had plates out while we were producing water, that's the best we have to demonstrate uh, the impact of water production on our water district. So what's the question? Well, that's, uh, Nick, uh, Nick wanted to know if, that, if the report from that work is available. I'll check. I'll check to see if we got both yeah. of them. We go on the assumption that whatever we produce goes into state uh, possession and it's publicly available. That's, just, that's normal. So I'd be shocked if you would if you could.
couldn't get your hands on whatever we produce. There, there, there are actually two publicly available subsidence studies. One was done by Tetratech and is short term in nature, up to one year. And the other one, which is listed as preliminary, was done by Itasca and it covers 30 years. I think Nick is talking. And they are, they are, they are both available. You got, you got that. Uh, you got a copy of that. Oh. Those are actually. Yeah. Those, you yeah. have a copy. It's been distributed to the Blue Ribbon Commission. You're talking about the thirty year. Uh, yeah. yeah. You're talking yeah. about yeah. the thirty year, or, or the, you're talking about the long term or the short term. You talking to me? Yeah. Yes, yeah, both of them. Can you email? You got an email address. Yeah, that's the one. Go back to November fifth on the board. No, no, I, I, I believe, I believe, I believe Pat is the DNR, uh, you know, public uh, communications person. You can get and he should send that. What you looking? Let me just. And I'll tell you, Tasca's already out. Tasca's out. Tasca, we put on the blog site. Yeah, that's what we put. A link and direction directly to the DNR site about that. Yeah, if you pull up our Bayou Corps reports, I think it's under the tab for subsidence studies. So that one's already there, and we did that probably a couple of months ago. No, I, think, I think it was November the 5th. November the 5th, you said November the 8th. Sure. Sure. Uh, you got me. That was even post sure. around. Would you agree, though, Patrick, that whatever whatever we generate it becomes public? Yeah, we touch it public, right? Right. All right. My question again is, is that the last meeting, town hall meeting we had at Assumption Community Center, mm -hmm. uh, when we talked about dual phase vacuum system, was that there was going to be a study during the study. You're talking about the one where they were running the numbers, or the one where they actually did the study out the here, they, west of the borough? After, 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 after the discussion, it was decided that, that a study would be done on, on the, the, subsidence, the effect of, on the subsidence. Mm -hmm. And so now they're proposed. There's is that two sites, Mark? I'm not sure. Is it two sites that you're talking about? Yeah, but, but uh, let's let's don't lose fact. We're not talking about dual phase vapor yeah, tracks. Yeah. We're just using those wells yeah, that we put in to the way passive. we were going to do and that they, technology. Uh, this is not this right, is not well, dual phase. Maybe I misunderstood because I yeah. thought you said dual phase. No, no, no. no. We're, we're using just, the wells in yeah, place. Let me let me let me let me summarize what happened. When we were considering dual phase, we, we installed. Two wells, and we were in the process of beginning pilot testing of dual phase vapor extraction. It was during that time period after construction began on those wells that we realized that there was too much risk from water production. And that was when uh, Dr. Garlinger, who works for Artiman, who works for Tetratech, provided some modeling results, preliminary modeling results, that <coughs> indicated that there was a relatively high risk of subsidence. So we terminated that work. When I mentioned dual phase a while ago, Nick, it was just to refer to the wells and then we're going to convert them to passive bitlines. Yeah, today we, we probably got maybe 100 gallons of water out of, of each one of those when we developed them. I mean, that's 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 all that's been pumped out of those wells. So those are those are virgin wells. Right. So what's going forward? He talked about, Mark talked about the ORW38 test, which is on the north side. Everybody knows where it is next to DC2. As part of that work plan, DNR is requiring very uh, close spaced and frequent monitoring right around that when they're doing the test. We're going out in three directions all the way around it. Now that is on a piece of Texas Brine owned property and uh, they have to report that to DNR weekly. Because there's been a lot of issues on consolidation of the subsidence. The best way to start answering that is do the ORW38 test and collect some real data in the community <coughs> that's high precision. I think either Fence Rucker or Miller do it. Both of them are very qualified to do it. They'll do it. And that's going to be the best test to help us answer some of these subsidence consolidation issues. So instead of just modeling and running numbers, we decided to take the opportunity on that test. Let's go get some hardcore numbers 
in and around the test. And because they're doing it daily and it's being reported weekly, if it looks like things are greater than maybe we're comfortable with, all we have, all Texas Brian has to do is, is stop the test, okay? But we've got to get some hard data, and, and that's going to be the best data we've got because it's in the community, and it's going to be laid out in a very detailed network. Is that the only, only location that you're going to sample? Well, after they get 38 done, we've got a similar location, 21, which is over on Crawfish Stew. When they do the dewatering test there, that that will be another one we collect data. We'll see what that data looks like, and then we'll take it to the right. I, I guess, you know, there seems to be a lot of information that you guys know that maybe you figure you know, it's insignificant to us, but, it's, you know, we've been screaming for for meetings just to, to be briefed on what's going on and information like what you're talking about, and, you know. Because of the consolidation issue, and we wanted, in our requested weekly reporting, so that can be communicated back to the community, because everybody in this room knows that's a big deal, and that's why it's requested to be reported weekly, and then it can be put in a form you can kind of understand it as opposed to just filing numbers. But that's why the reporting was set up the way it was, because they knew it was a big deal. The, the plates that are that are being put in, you know, just to, to address movement and, and, and subsidence and everything, uh, when I look at the blog, I, I see that, that that information is being collected, but where is it being collected and where is it available to, to us? Uh, what I can tell you, Nick, is we're going to talk to DNR and we'll see. The problem with a lot of survey data is just file of numbers. And can it be put in a format so you can understand it better? Uh, certainly, we'll work with DNR and see if we can get it in a format that's easier to understand. And if, if you got or anybody's got some particular things, hey, this is an information vacuum. We need more information on this part or that part. Well, well uh, I think what he's talking about, if you read the blog, there's a lot of surveying and stuff. And where's the result? The data's okay. going to DNR, mm -hmm. but right now it's just a pile of numbers. <coughs> Can that be digested into a form that's easier to understand? When we find out really what, what's happening, once we find out that the subsidence of the car and the south farm is sinking, at that point we know that all these measurements that have been taken, so that's, that's what it amounted to, you know. It just uh, uh, down the road from day to day. And, and it's very, and I understand it's very difficult, just like Dr. Hedock says, is the fact that once it started sinking, then they they rebuilt it, now you have to establish the benchmark again, because the benchmarks are now underwater. <laughs> so what, I, so what I'm here you have to understand is, that. Texas Brian is collecting a lot of data on subsidence and everything else. What I'm hearing from you, you would like it in a format that's accessible to you, that's easier to understand. You know, maybe. We're looking at it as it comes in. As long as we're informed and something's changing, that's fine. Yeah. But, you know, Nick would like to see some additional data, and, and we're trying to make everybody. Texas Brian is doing a good job of collecting the subsidence data, I can tell you that. It's just now it's a matter of communicating with the public in a format that, that's easier to understand. Yeah, we're, we're not geologists. So it's like we don't understand the data as you would put it out and understand it. Yeah. That table you of know, numbers probably need, doesn't need a whole lot. Right. It's hard to and we can do that. For those of y'all who have seen like, the attached to subsidence, look, I mean, is that a format that works for you, kind of a broad ranges of what's moving how fast? Well, the, stu the study that was done in November. Mm -hmm. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what's the best way to get out there to make some useful for you. It might actually be helpful to repost that for people and to clarify. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's on the website what, now. It, 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 that, that's website. right. It's on the DNR website if you know how to find it. 
Would but it might it might be helpful to give people a quick link. We can push the back out. And, and and then and include, you know, this new new area you're talking about, you know, whatever areas that you're sampling, you know. Uh, well I'm thinking given the sensitivity and a once the RW thirty eight test gets started, probably about halfway through it, it's gonna be beneficial probably to have a another get together here where we can talk specifically about that. Here's what we're seeing, here's what's going on with the gas, <coughs> just as an informational meeting. Yeah. Now, I, would, yeah, I, I would propose that we that we get together probably once a month at least. And we can schedule that with John, get it out on the blog and, and we'll be here and we'll, we'll make it happen. Yeah. Well, it, 38 is a is a shallow well? It's or a deep well. Deep well. Okay. I'm, I'm just um, <coughs> about, about well, I'm just wondering why we, I thought we were talking about the size on the, on the uh, two phase. Well, but this will, because they're going to dewater that, it's going to give us the whole soil column. So you're going to try to dewater that one? Is what you're saying? Yeah, that's what, what Mark was describing. So but, but again, I want to make sure that I'm just trying to, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm just trying to understand what you're going to do. This yeah. You're going to, well, let me, let me, let me help with that because I think there's still some uh, mixing or confusion about what dual phase was intended to be and, and what we're proposing with uh, with this, we'll call it passive water production. Um, we have uh, uh, Leaf Well 1, right? That, and that, that was the, the first one that we actually pulled water out of in very low volumes, maybe one to two gallons a minute. OGRW1? OGRW1. Yeah, one. Oh, just about a gallon a minute now. About a gallon a minute. And what happened when we, when we, when we started that process, we saw about 20, 30, maybe a 40 percent increase. About 100 percent. Okay, it almost doubled. So that was an eye opener. But that's a unique well. That's a well that's produced the bulk of the gas that, that we've recovered. But it, it's led us to conclude, since we're dealing with gas that's at, right on the cusp of the hydrostatic pressure in the top of the MRA, what we conclude is that maybe if we just lift a little bit of that water out of that well bore, we can get gas production to come in. 38 was one of those wells. That was in an area where we had bubbling, we had indicators that it should be producing, but it never did, never would. And because it's on property that we now own, and it's it's in an area where we know we've got gas or should have gas, then we want to we want to trickle some water out of that well too and see what happens. But but dual phase vapor extraction is a totally different animal. Okay. And when we were talking about dual phase, we were thinking what 50, 100 gallon a minute. Okay, yes, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I hate to run it here, but isn't that supposed to be, doesn't, isn't the high point over here and it slopes that away, like, I don't know, like 130 something feet over there? I mean, like 109 feet here? Okay, where, so, where I don't have the gas to get out there, don't we have to have 30 feet of gas right here? 460. How does it do that? How does it travel it, it down It tends to follow it, okay? Because you're flowing through sand, it, it's thick over here, everybody knows that. It's getting thinner to the north, okay, but it's still following the, the, the clay and sand. So, yeah, it's just following. Yeah, the, the bottom of the sand is shaped like a dome, just like the top is. So the the, boat, the, the gas is also shaped like a dome. Yeah, right in this area, yes. And what 38 is, it appears over W38 is kind of on the north edge of, of that, and every time they've dewatered that, two or three hours the gas pressure's gone up, which indicates if you dewater and, and sustain that, it's very likely they'll be able to get a fair amount of gas out. And that's what this test is designed for. Well, because they're going to be lowering the water level in that well, we decided that if you do a level survey around that, you can get consolidation and subsidence data right around that, and then you can use real-world Bayou Corn community data to update any future consolidation calculations. All right, so if the sportsman area in this area has the largest volume of gas, and we've got, what, you've got two wells in here, and, mm -hmm. well, a third, well, we've got four, and then across, <coughs> why aren't you sampling subsidence in that area. Because these right now are not being dewatered. Okay. But but why is it that you 
you don't establish a benchmark so that you can see what. Oh, you you're, you're talking establishing a survey benchmark. Actually, there's survey points all along the road through here, okay. and those are surveyed. Benstromacher does it periodically. DOTD does it. We got. But, I mean, but that's. Well, are there any down sportsman's drive in the community? Yeah, they do. Fence to make will come down here. Yeah. I saw fence to make it all a couple yeah, of times. They don't go ahead and I don't know if they have established them or not. No, they did. Because uh, he told me there's no subsidence down our neighborhood yet. Yeah, what they're doing, and I, I don't know if it's Fence Mark or Miller, but the Geopro wells that are installed around the community, the shallow wells, each one of those are also surveyed. And they're, just, they're using those instead of putting a new benchmark, they're just using that because they're all cemented in. Yeah. And they do that periodically. They did it a couple weeks ago. Point out 38 on the map. I don't know if everybody knows what 38 is. What's the benchmark we're using now? Well, this one. The, the work plan is they're actually going to establish a network of survey points around this. In, in that one yard? In when that they do the, the dewatering test, there will be a whole uh, <coughs> system that Miller will put in. They'll probably put in rods, and then they'll go back to each rod. <coughs> and it's the same type of survey <coughs> technique they use on the south berm, and then on the south berm it work really well. <coughs> see as it was starting to creep down because it's very accurate the way they do it it's within like a hundredth of a foot and that's what they're going to be doing around here and then when they move to 20 points and it's coming up on its uh, i guess its first annual report i don't know that it's been released yet but this is a satellite derived uh, process where very frequently i don't know the exact number but there are satellites that circle taking elevation uh, readings off of surfaces that they can see. It doesn't work in water, but it'll work on a rooftop or a roadway or you know, a building. Uh, because we had areas around the sinkhole that were, that were swamped, we went in and put artificial reflectors. And so now we've got probably six or eight months of that data. And we're told that the accuracy of that process is better than the process we're using now. We're committed to continuing that process. So that'll be that'll be released uh, probably in the next month. Like all the houses in the community, we we actually had a preliminary report <coughs> last fall, just kind of a proof of concept. All the all the homes in the community and stuff they use the roofs as reflectors, and so you get a very in the community itself you get a very dense network of. Uh, Subsidence or lack of subsidence, depending on what's going on. So when that's reported out, essentially, you'll see like all the roofs and stuff in here will actually have dots on them because that's what they use. What about treetops? Pardon? Can they detect the elevation of treetops? No. Yeah. Yeah. Tree roofs moving and growing. Yeah. You know, trees are growing an inch in a year. That's why Texas Brine, you, you see these. I guess they're aluminum or something out, out in the swamp on poles. They're a circular thing, and they kind of look like they've got a funny hat on them. Those are the NSAR reflectors. So in the swamp, you have to put up something that the this microwave beam can bounce off of. So anyway, on subsidence, I'm here to tell you with the 38 tests and the 21 tests, Tex Brian's going to get some real data in the community that we can use to see <coughs> further, better evaluate what's going on because you need data here. Up till now it's been modeling, pulling numbers from various places here, we're going to get data in the community. Well, thank you, Gary. Is there anybody, uh, any other questions or comments? Who has, in, who has information on what's going on in Grand Valley? That would be John. I can uh, give you some of it. And I'm just curious as to what kind of wetlands are you using? What's the sign? Wetlands, either wetlands. All right. Uh, and, and I've been speaking to both companies. Uh, they moved the pipeline location or something? Yeah. Well, 
they are, uh, both pumping the Cadian gas as well as Crosstex is now starting their reroutes. So we we finally received that permit to start the reroute. Cadian is about two weeks ahead of Crosstex. The, uh, the MPG site that you see on the corner of 69 and 70, they're, they're doing a Cadian line. They're, they have uh, started clearing right aways. They actually did cut both of their lines this past Saturday. They did a 15 uh, foot coal cut and took out a 15 foot section of line and have, have now started the, the putting the line. They blocked it in, now starting to put in the line, clearing the right ways. And they they both ex expect about three months of work. The cross tax line in their staging area is that next to Shelby Go Day Shop. Mm -hmm. And that, that one is it started after, and you can see all the survey flags and the paint out there now. That's going to be their lay down, lay down yard next to Shelby Godet's shop. But their line crosses right there and it, it comes back around to the same right away on the south end. So they are also started. They haven't made that cut on the 36 inch line yet, but they have started as well. So that 36 inch is going to cross at the end of the superior canal. Yes. Or the pink line, right? Right. So the the other yeah. signs. Entering wetlands. It's just between the, just on the right away. Uh, any explanation? Or no, I, I, I don't have a wetlands explanation. I don't have a wetlands explanation. But that's where, the, that's where they're actually going to clear up. Yes. It's cross right Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, they, 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 they both generally start to turn in the general, same generator. Not the same, but very close yeah. to each other. They're not all running in the same. No, and then okay. cross tech's going to go all the way around the dome and cross Highway 70 on the other side of Shelby right. Village yeah. Shop. Where Acadian Line is going on down. And you've seen the flagging work that work uh, they did there. Uh, that they're going through the aisle of their line. And they're only doing 120 inch. They, they've uh, taken the 220s and, and going to one and making 120 through. The, the status of the Florida gas line is still that line still active? No, it, it's shut in. It's shut in. They have no plans to reroute. Uh, it's my understanding, and they got bought out by another company. But their local reps do uh, attend some of our meetings, and he basically the last time we spoke about it, I don't think they're going to put those lines back in commission. But you never know with companies if they have any future intentions. But he did not think that they were going to do anything. But supposedly, it's their, the Florida line is just a crossover between two pipeline networks. Yeah. No, we don't. We reintroduce Will. 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 You get the bus of a, a, a new father. Excellent. He was more committed today than he was before the baby. That's because you don't want to go home. To your new father. Yeah, that's 
in our Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you